the best BDOs win the majority of their 50-50 calls. You got one shot at losing credibility in our world. I want some nitty gritty stories of times you guys have ever pushed back and it actually worked. When you are pushing back, I would advise against email if you can. That's going to get you more in your career internally than just saying, ah, man, screw it. I'm just going to go and ask his boss. I know he'll approve this. I heard Chris has a uh, present for Ryan, and I want to see Ooh. what it is. You know, I love a good uh, graphic T-shirt for all my loved ones. And I saw <laughs> this online, and I knew it was for one and only uh, Ryan Kroger. So there you go, brother. And your thing, your love. Oh, dude! Things, uh, <laughs> oh, this is amazing. Look at that right there. Freaking the that's, sheets. That's Freaking it, baby. Your, your love that's and affection awesome. for Microsoft. It's the XL he's had since 1999. Yeah. They'll make a graphic tee for anything, won't That's they? Absolutely. This is amazing, man. I didn't even know they... When, when he started <laughs> inputting cool. in Excel, you used to have to call Bill directly and tell him what you wanted typed in. <laughs> That's an ode to your uh, spreadsheet there with all well, your Well, thank you so much. School Chris, together. this is awesome, man. Thank you man. very much. <laughs> this is perfect. That's awesome. Freaking the spreadsheets, baby. Welcome, everybody, back to the BDO Show. This is a podcast for passionate BDOs wanting to level up their game with advice and stories from these battle-tested BDOs. We are here in Tampa. I am Emily Detour. I am with my fellow co-hosts, Chris Hackney, Sterling Birdsong, Ryan Krogi, and Alan Peterson. We are so excited to be here today. At the beginning of each episode, I'm always going to remind everybody to like, subscribe, and share, and go ahead and send over topics to the BDO Show at gmail.com. Okay, BDOs, it's story time. And no, I am not talking about the time Sterling tried to finance a zoo. You'll have to go back to episode three for that. I'm talking about the story that your borrower has in their head, and they may need that extra boost to finally get it onto paper. Rapid Business Plans is a known and trusted partner that can help them do just that. Whether your borrowers are working towards acquiring a business, starting one up, or expanding and making moves, within just a few short days, Rapid Business Plans will deliver powerful, fast, SBA, and USDA-ready business plans with projections and assumptions. If they need an export business plan for an ITL loan or a feasibility study, they have you covered there too. We know this process is not a walk in the park, or should I say zoo? <laughs> Let the Rapid Business Plans team take some of the wild out of the process so that your borrower's vision and passions can come to life. For more information or to get acquainted, email Bethany McClellan at bethany at rapidbusinessplans.com or click the link in the show notes. All right. Today's episode, we are going to talk about pushback. Is it a hill worth dying on? And I'm going to start with Sterling. There is certainly an art to pushing back. Um, you do need to know when to do it, when not to do it. But I can tell you that the best BDOs win the majority of their 50-50 calls. And so how do you win those 50-50 calls? You have to understand what the pain points are. You have to understand why, if we're talking about credit, for example, why maybe a chief credit officer wouldn't feel comfortable with a structure or why they wouldn't feel comfortable with a guarantor. And you have to be able to position things in the right way to make it look in the best light possible while at the same time telling a narrative that is not far from the truth, right? You have to be honest, but at the same time, you have to learn how to spin a little bit so that you make sure that you are showing the side that you want to show. Right. It's almost like uh, when you're taking a picture, right? You have a good side and a bad side, right? Like get my good side. You want to make sure that when you are pushing back, especially in a credit committee, that you're pushing back and showing your customers good side, essentially. And that type of stuff. I mean, it takes reps, man. And that's why I said this is really more of an art than a science, you know, and a lot of it actually comes down to your individual bank and knowing your internal gatekeepers, if you will, that are the ones who are essentially keeping you from the pile of money or keeping your customer from the pile of money at the end right. of the rainbow, right? So understanding who you need to speak to in a certain way. Um, you know, some people like to be spoken to very friendly. Some people maybe have to be a little bit harsher with, you know, um, but that's how you kind of learn how to push back in an effective way so that you can get results because that's what it's really all about at the end of the day. Again, winning those 50-50 calls and making sure you can actually close a deal for your customer. Yep. And, and not only knowing when to push back, but how to push back. Because mm -hmm. you can win every single time pushing back. You might not get the deal done, but you could have deepened that relationship with that uh, 
decision maker within your own bank because of the way you pushed they back. They respected the way you pushed back. They saw that you respected their position. Because a lot of times in a lot of financial institutions, everyone thinks, especially as salespeople, everyone thinks the BDO is the top dog right? And that we've got this massive ego and a lot of them talk down to people. And your tribe is the most important part of us getting deals done to begin with. So you want to talk to whoever that decision maker is, whoever that person is in your tribe that you're having this pushback with, with respect, number one. Number two, you got to lay your case out. Like you said, know how to push back, know when to push back. And God forbid, if you get to a stalemate and you still think that this is a hill we're dying on and you go up one level, don't do it behind their back. Mm -hmm. I always ask permission. If I have a credit team lead like we do and we disagree on a deal, I am not just going to turn around and go above his head. I'm going to say, hey, we do not see eye to eye on this. I understand your position. I respect your position. Your position makes sense, but mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Do you mind if I go up one level and have this conversation? And in fact, do you want to be in on that meeting when we have this conversation? That's going to get you more in your career internally than just saying, ah, man, screw it. I'm just going to go and ask his boss. I know he'll approve this. No, you, you're not going to get anywhere because you're just going to burn that bridge with your credit team lead who sees the majority of your deals and probably submits the majority of your deals. And you just damage that entire relationship. And the same goes with closing. Yeah, too. You never want to make it adversarial. Exactly. Right. Definitely. You, you don't Definitely want to don't give them a reason it. to want to make your life difficult. You got one shot at losing credibility in our world. Once you lose credibility internally, I'm talking now with your credit team, your closing team. Packages, everybody that comes together, the tribe at large, right? Because they're just going to say, this is how this guy is going to be I, every time. I saw it happen before, right? I've seen I've seen people come in like a bull in a china shop. They're mean to this one. They're this, da, 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 da. They generally don't last long, thank God, right? right. Because you, it's got to be the right way, and it's got to be a collaborative approach. And, and, you know, the point of like Hill worth dying on, it's interesting too because there are times where you know, if we don't see eye to eye, I'll, I'll explain my position. But very often, if I get a, a, like a thought out, detailed response of why perhaps they're not comfortable unless we adjust this or address this or restructure a little or I'd be more comfortable if X, you know, that's an amazing thing to have. To have that open door policy where we have access to the credit folks, that's amazing, right? Right. Because when you're having those conversations, you kind of know where they're at. And if they're not agreeing with you or seeing eye to eye, that's all right. You know, they, they, no one's going to blame you for trying to, to get a deal done, right? You're sponsoring the credit for a reason. It must have some significant strength that you believe in. You believe in the story. And that's great. But when they're not so willing to do a deal based on whatever, be open-minded and really think about it. So there's been times where I'm like, you know, that's a good point. We should actually do this this way. Thanks for the heads up on it. Or, you know, we're not comfortable with this at all. And then, quite frankly, then I know that for me, I'll send them to another bank that will do the deal where I know that there's different appetite. Yeah, and there's right. no individual hill worth dying on. No. Just right. to be very clear, there's never been one deal in my entire career that I thought, this is the hill that I'm going to die on. No. You know, and I'll, I'll fight hard sometimes for a good deal if I really believe in it. Right. But if the answer is no, the answer is no. Right. And part of knowing when to push back is also knowing when to let it be. Sometimes you just have to realize that the person who is in that decision-making position is the decision maker, right. right? You can appeal to that authority, but if that authority ultimately says no, you have to be able to take that on the chin, move on to the next deal, because there's no individual hill worth dying on. You got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, right? Shout out to Kenny Rogers. <laughs> RIP. And, and you got to know how to bow out too. Bow out with grace. Don't be adversarial. I think you said it, Chris. Don't be adversarial. Do not try to push the envelope. You want to bow out, bow out grace. Keep everything de-escalated. But here's some advice. If it does get escalated, if the individual on the other end or even yourself starts getting upset over the situation, take a break. Say, you know what, Chris? We're not seeing eye to eye on this right now. Do you mind if we just take a break? sleep on this. I've had a long day. So it seems like I'm getting a little riled up and I apologize for that, but let's just sleep on this. And do, can we talk tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock? Great. Right. But don't just try to push it because you need an answer right then and there. You need closure right then and there. No one to bow out gracefully, no one to deescalate a situation so that you're not ruining your relationships. We could flip this a little bit. So as the president 
do you El <laughs> do you push back? Do I a push? Lot? Absolutely. Um, I my goal is production um, first and foremost, and obviously equally as important as credit quality. If it's a deal that makes sense, because I'm recent as a lender, and I know we've done similar deals. It's a delicate dance. I wouldn't advise this for someone newer uh, in lending or uh, newer in their career. But if you're maybe two or three years in, you can reference similar types of transactions. There's a way you can craft your email or have a conversation where, hey, this was a liquor store acquisition, kind of similar cash flow. They call similar, it precedent in, a precedent, in the legal exactly. world, right? Exactly. Right. So you can, you can reference some precedents without saying, well, you did this. You should do this one, right? Right. I and make sure the deal's paying. What's that? Make, make sure, yeah, make sure, look up, make you know, sure they're current. So they're paying and make sure that they're paying. <laughs> but I have to be in my current more selective in pushing back because it's not just me and Lynn and all the lenders and Sterling, right? I have underwriting closers. So I can't be pushing back on everything just because Sterling wants his deal done. Right. So they're all going to be like, well, Chris just cares about the lenders. So I have to be more selective. Um, and at the end of the day, it's all of, does this deal make sense? And is this going to get repaid? And if I feel that way, I want to push back and fight for it. And there's a way I usually just bring everyone in on a call, right? If it's really something that no one can agree on, let's just jump on a quick 10, 15 minute call. Mm -hmm. What's your position? What's your position? How can we come to some sort of compromise? If we can't come to a compromise, then maybe we agree to walk away from this deal too. So I highly advise when you are pushing back, I would advise against email if you can, because again, you want to eliminate the kind of leading into tones in email and, and someone assuming what somebody meant. Yeah, how you're saying something. I would say, hey, can we jump on a quick, like uh, Krogi said, or Ryan said, hey, I'd like to take this a level up. Would you like to be in on that call? That way you're having a conversation. You can build some rapport when you start the conversation, Absolutely. right? It's not just, here's why we should do this deal. Here's why you don't say we should do this deal hear the mitigants and you send an email, who's going to, who's really going to say, yes, you're right. After they already said no, right. So jump on a call. Like Sterling, we had one uh, earlier this week. We were trying to structure it a certain way. Um, they wanted, I called it a uh, firing squad deal killing session, but it turned out well, Sterling's a, a great lender and salesperson and it ended up getting the deal approved in a call, which I thought, God, this is never going to work. <laughs> I, but, yeah. it, it did seem like that call was set up just to kill that deal. It, and I knew it wasn't. I'm like, oh, how do I motivate him after? Like, he's going to be so down. But, Googling motivational quotes. But yeah, <laughs> but the, the way that he pushed back and we pushed back. We made them see why this was a strong deal. And we got to a compromise of, okay, we need to reduce the leverage if we can increase seller note, if we can get more cash in. Yeah. But because we had a conversation, had we just sent an email around, I don't think that deal gets done as presented and just going back and forth via email. I don't know how so, you feel. So here's just a little quick tip for anybody who's presenting in front of a committee. Whenever you start getting these like little tangents that the chief credit officer and things want to kind of maybe take you on make sure that it's okay to go in those directions as long as those directions are leading you away from the no right because if it's a situation where all of a sudden they're like well you know maybe a seller note would be better for this it's like you know what that's a great idea and I think goes, a seller note think, would be fantastic in this goes, transaction. I think we have a, a quorum, and is the loan approved? Yeah. Now? I couldn't believe it. Like, <laughs> I did actually do that too, because there yeah. was enough decision makers on this private call where I was like, you know, this is actually. He do we have a quorum here? This is all loan I committee. Said, Can yeah. we just approve this now? Like <laughs> say, the day before loan yeah. committee happens, I'm like, oh, it's Sterling. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but you know, I, I do that sometimes where it's like, you know, I I see the glimmer of hope of how something can get snatched from the jaws of defeat. And there's maybe a way that they're willing to maybe restructure it. And I'll just go right down that road because it's better than to know. A, a good thing, too, I would advise, too, if you're newer on and, you know, we're talking about pushback specifically now with your credit partners and decision makers and that part. Always be armed, right? Like have actual documentation or source data or have something like when you have an opinion of why, yes, I see what you're saying, but actually you know, based on this, you, it's, it's not really quite that way. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and just be able to have an educated response. And if you're not ready to give an educated response, take the Ryan Krogi advice and sleep on it, right? And, and wait until mm -hmm. tomorrow, but stay up all night doing your research because you got to win that deal. Right. right? <laughs> oh, always, always come with the receipts, man. Always bring receipt, the receipts. Man. You got to have them. And push them back in general, right? There's times where I have to push back externally right because 
a referral partner perhaps that we've got a great relationship with maybe has a deal that doesn't work so well. And, you know, pushing back to those folks is, is interesting. Um, you know, not doing certain types of loans. There's certain use of proceeds that as an SBA lender, I don't do. I'm not a good home for certain transactions, you know? Right. And, and sometimes that's kind of tricky too, to, to, to realize, especially when you're early on, not all the referral partners are going to be great for you. I mean, being able to kind of explain to them, you know, that that's that setting that guardrail, that boundary, right? Yeah. That's, that's a form of pushback too, in a way. Right. I also wanted to take a step back, pushing internally, pushing back internally. You want to push back informed, right? Yeah. A lot of times the BDOs that struggle, they push back with just highlighting the strengths that were already identified in the memo. Right. That is not going to change that mm -hmm. credit officer's mind. They already know the strengths of it. There, it's, it's right. written out. If you're saying, "Oh, this deal has great cash flow," or this one strength and everything else is bad, you have to address the the risk or the weaknesses and the mitigants for that, and say, "Hey, here's how I got comfortable with it. I understand that liquidity is light, but I did structure this with some working capital. And did you know? Just to remind you, there's working capital baked into the deal from the seller." that would help with the post-closing liquidity. That's, that's great advice. Tom Zernick, right? Guy that we, we all like a lot. I mean, you know, he taught me when my first committee presentation was coming up, he talked to me the night before and uh, he, he's the best, right? And he's like, listen, man, like don't pitch the deal in committee. We know you think it's a good deal right. because you sponsored the credit, you know? And I go, no, I know, I understand. And he's like, I'm just giving you some advice. Like, just because, you know, we're going to have a higher chance of just, keeping it short to the point, address the negatives, bring up your mitigants, explain, you know, justify those mitigants and wait. He's like, should we say what mitigants are too? Did we? So mitigants are things that de-risk the, the situation, right? It's like, yes, but is a really easy way to put it. So even if you're not involved in commercial lending and you're tuning in from Vesuvio's sports bar in Wilkes-Barre, <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> There we shout, out so Vesuvio, bad. shout out to Vesuvio Sports Bar, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Thanks for tuning in. So mitigants are like your yeah, but. So when they go, hey, you know, the loan doesn't have, you know, post-close liquidity. Yeah, but we got the spouse to guarantee and they have ongoing outside income that's pretty significant. That's a mitigant, right? Um, you know, and, and so when you have like those, those yeah, buts, that's kind of what mitigants are. But anyway, the advice that was given to me was like your first committee, dude, like we get it. Like you want to do the deal you're a lender, you sponsor this credit, <laughs> right. you know, don't come in there and, and explain to the, the chief credit officer in open forum of like, well, we got to do it because of this, you know? So that was kind of funny. And sometimes in those uh, credit committees too, I mean, I haven't been in a credit committee in a long time because we have single no sign authority in the last you, eight years. You, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but for the internet. Ones and zeros, ones and zeros, <laughs> ones, the internet. <laughs> We're all about efficiencies over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, Drama. <laughs> When when I was a part of a committee, uh, the the best advice I used to always give is less is more. Yes. Give the meat yep. and potatoes, explain your deal, explain why you like it, and explain why it should be done, and then let the conversations go. And when there's conversations at the table, don't just force yourself in there. Let them come up with the realization themselves, and don't answer anything unless the question is directed <laughs> you, right at you. When you talk too much, too. You can tank your own I, deal. I mean, you, can, okay. you can yeah. definitely tank your own deal because you're giving too much uh, 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 information like, out there, what? and they're like, wait they're a minute, like, and yeah. you're just giving them more ammo to shoot holes within it. Less is always more. Yeah. You, mitig you mitigate the, the most obvious weaknesses. Right, right. You, you, you highlight the strengths. Yeah. The five and you, C's of credit, let's get comfortable there. Yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. How do they make a buck? Explain. And then that's it. And you say, yeah. that's my deal. Yeah. And let them, let them have conversations. I love you brought that up because I've definitely been in like trying to over and then, and, 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 and they're just like, wait a minute, wait, they do what? And I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and meanwhile, I'm looking over and uh, the sales side of the committee. So in a, a bank president and sales, they're all like, <laughs> Ow, you <laughs> mean, <I'm just> like, <laughs> have you guys ever um like maybe gotten a suggestion from your credit committee and you were like i don't like this suggestion but the vibe is off today so i'm gonna take it accept it research it come back with more information and see if they can change their mind have sure. you ever done all that the time. all the time yeah yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah. the vibe is off completely or like something, yeah, sometimes something's weird here. So, so in our in our shop, you can tell what meetings the exec team is coming out of oh, yeah. based <laughs> upon the reception of the credit. Right. I've noticed when they're coming out of kind of like a production meeting or a earnings meeting, mm -hmm. 
and you know maybe a marginal credit maybe they don't ask as many questions it's, it's just like gonna be a no parade earnings. yeah <laughs> we're looking at earnings and maybe we do need this deal or they're coming out an asset quality meeting and it's like no way are we ever lending money ever, ever again, again. <laughs> so if you have the inside scoop on that that yeah. uh, can be helpful as well a lot of times push I'll, this meeting to next week yeah a lot of times I'll, I'll let some of the lenders know like hey just so you know asset quality was last week or we just had a, a portfolio pm meeting and a lot of past dues just so you're aware that's the mood and the vibe they're going to be in so you take that information and understand like hey maybe the pushback today is just something you receive get more information and address it later instead of pushing back on that particular call and trying to just jam the deal through because they already have their mind kind of in a certain mode yeah. in that based on the prior meeting. That's a good question. And it's all about timing too, right? right? Cause I know that it, it, we're just a high volume shop. So we've got a lot of deals coming we're in. Just and out of we're just a high volume burr, burr, shop. We're just a high volume shop. Everybody no loves committee? the internet. No they like to to the internet. No, <laughs> no wonder you're getting all these deals. Open door policy with credit management. It's phenomenal. Ooh. So if I get that call from uh, our credit manager and just saying, look, I don't like this deal, but I will like it if you do X, Y, and Z. I'll, at the end of the day, I know I'm not going to get much if I try to push him back because it's the end of the day. It's five, four, five o'clock. He's probably been jammed with deals all day. He's been saying yes or no all day. I know the state of his mind is just, he's probably not looking at it right. I know I can mitigate it right then and there, but I also know first thing in the morning, he's going to be a lot more fresher, a lot more open mind, a lot more receptive to my mitigants and my uh, uh, feedback. So I'll say, yeah, I'll, you know what? Let me take it. Let me think about it for, for a minute. I'll, I'll think about it. And do you mind if I get back with you tomorrow morning? 90, 99% of the time is like, yeah, no problem. So I'll call him first thing You guys thing have probably learned, learned a lot from like wives and girlfriends too. Oh, I've been like this for pushback, 24 years. Pushback like is it art is because of women? Art. Let me tell you right now. Like I am give you guys no credit. I'm going to give it all to the females. <laughs> um, my, my next question I will co-sign on that. That yeah. is for sure. You will. I want some nitty gritty stories of times you guys have ever pushed back and it actually worked. Like, do you guys have a specific loan in mind where you were like, I'm not going to die on this hill, but I'm adamant. I pitched a deal to committee uh, on a site visit for the same business in the Detroit airport in yeah. the winter. It was in Toledo, it's Ohio. It's a nice airport. <laughs> oh my God. Everything in Detroit is perfect, people. We all know this now. You guys might remember this. It was right around Valentine's Day. I pitched it in committee. It was a big self-storage deal. I was doing it in Toledo, Ohio. And I was going to pitch it in committee because I couldn't wait. I, they, I couldn't wait another week. To, to meet with them. So I took a boat in the snow. I don't own a, co a coat because I'm in, I live in Florida now and whatever. You're like, I'm poor. I need this coat. I need coat. <laughs> they get, and I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show them. I'm so hardworking. I'm going to take a video call in the snow at the airport. They're going to have to approve the deal. You guys were on the call. They were uncomfortable because it was, um, the structure had like a bunch of, it was a really sophisticated structure for a seven. It was like some GP LP, like investment play and whatever and i'm trying to explain all that like from the airport right shivering and they're like al we're just gonna have to we're gonna have to talk about this next week like we think there's a deal here but this is like unreasonable like you look, look like you. you're in pain <laughs> yeah, like, but, but, you're in a blizzard yeah i'm like i gotta get on a plane in 10 minutes but i'm taking time to talk to you right it was funny because i remember texting you guys and saying i guarantee you i'll get this approval next week i guarantee it so i took that extra time and really sharpened up a little bit. And you then when I said it would close by a certain date too. And you it put did. a wager on it. I put and a, it closed, I, you know, I, shortly thereafter. I made a wager. Yeah, we closed that one fast. No too. approval too. <laughs> yeah, we got the approval approval closing fast. But you know, that's an example though of kind of where pushing back worked. Like I I wanted to do it in that moment, but then when I came back with all the detailed information, I got a legal opinion on the structure that it was in fact eligible. There was no issue. That's really all I needed. You know what I mean? But it was hard for me to. To, to, to figure that out while I was trying to oversell my my work ethic. You know what I mean? Yeah. So long story short, go get frostbite and the pushback will be accepted. Now my next question, my next other well, piece. I an answer for that. Well, go ahead. Oh no, go. I mean, I had go. An too. I've it's not just the Al show. Yeah. Oh. Saying. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't really I, see, I see. I thought it was though. I thought, <laughs> well, yeah. It should be. It, it should, should be. be. Yeah, yeah, Soon. Yeah. Okay. For that sports bar in Pennsylvania, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Vesuvio's. <laughs> Yeah. Pizzeria and sports bar. We got a location in Drums, <laughs> Hazleton, Wilkesbury. Hit me with that air horn. Oh my God. Hit me with that air horn. Are these real town names or are you just making them up? These are my homeboys I'm talking about. This is real stuff. Oh, yeah. this is real. Oh, okay. Okay. Shout out to Donald Sabatino. They're broadcasting. Yeah. I get better, I get better stock tips from my pizza guy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys gotta meet Donald. We'll talk about that another time. Bring him on the show. <laughs> I can't think of like a deal, but I'll push back on things in our process or closing items or underwriter kind of conditions yeah. that don't make sense. Yeah. 
Because I know my SOP. Every, like, I'm on top of my stuff. Oh, yeah. man, I can and do so a whole show on you know that. Your yeah. SO, you know your SOP until I, you don't because yeah. it changes. <laughs> it does, but I'm pretty sharp at that. And when you're asking for things that don't make sense or aren't required, are you putting it in there? I said, no, I'm going to push back. This is not required. Doesn't protect the, the, the underwriter bank. asks this many questions. Bank. I ask this many questions. Right, it's, it's that. But there's also, for one example, we were sellers' tax clearance letters. Which Anna Erig, I hope you're listening. Uh, when she was at our bank, I said, "There's for two years, I fought her on why we needed this. I don't know if y'all remember. Oh, I remember this. that. I remember that. And I just this was a hill. This was I was a two year to die fight. On. This was a hill. Bro, we were every getting all of time, our deals were getting jammed up with that. No matter the size of the deal the what the working capital included and it didn't make sense i said this is not jeopardizing our transaction and i asked i said how many deals have gone bad because we didn't obtain the seller tax clearance letters have we had one deal that blew up because the seller had prior tax liability right you're getting to do diligence search the attorney is running searches on the seller all of that is covered this one letter or certification because what happens depending on the state especially in the Northeast, that can take two, three months. Or it takes California, about three months in Michigan. In a competitive environment when your other lenders are not requiring it and you're doing an acquisition and you say, wait, we need this letter, the seller's tax clearance letter, and it's going to take an additional three months to close a loan. So I kept fighting it, kept fighting it. Eventually, we got a policy in place. Then people forgot that policy. So then I had to remind them, no, we established this policy. So it's, that was one where I was not my best self, but I knew it was making us less competitive. So I definitely pushed back on that. Anna, I still do love you. Shout out to Anna Eric. Shout out to Anna <laughs> Eric. Few disagreements where I just said, hey, this doesn't make sense. So as a lender, not only is the credit, but you have to look at the closing conditions, yep. the underwriting conditions. Think about, does this make sense yep. for SOP? Does this make sense for the transaction? Because what can happen if you're not savvy, you can have all these, you can get your approval, and then you've got all these conditions that you can't meet, things that are going to slow your deal down from closing, and you should have pushed back on that in underwriting before you got the approval. Now you have to go back and say, hey, can we waive this requirement, which takes more time, mm -hmm. and then you're less likely to get that waived at that point because they're like, no, the deal's approved as this, keep it moving. Yeah, I was talking about tax liability, so I'm going to give another shout out to Birmingham Title if you guys are watching Birmingham Title is awesome. <laughs> We were in the same situation where requesting tax uh, clearance letters was taking two to three months in the state of Michigan. And because Birmingham Title is owned and run by attorneys. You can't, you can't do it on the couch. We got to do this holding it up. There we go. There it is. They immediately came back to me and said, well, we know what their estimated tax liability is going to be for three months. Why don't we just take that amount and hold 150% of it in escrow until you get the letter? The, one of the most simplest things. Now there's no pushback. We close every deal during a normal course in a normal time. And if the tax clearance letter isn't in the file yet, we just escrow it with Birmingham. Right. It, that's smart. That's, that's yeah. one of the things I said. It's Why great. can't we do this? So yeah. I, I, I proposed different ways that we could handle that and manage it, but they still wanted those letters. And eventually yeah. we got it resolved. But yeah. One, one thing that I've pushed back on that I don't see every lender necessarily push back on is I push back on third party reports mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. I've successfully pushed back on phase ones that said we need to go to a phase two. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I in favor that. of. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And and they stuck with a phase one. I had that happen uh, more than once. And um, I even my, my best victory of all time was pushing back on an appraisal. appraisal I remember that. Yeah. And actually um, getting our chief credit officer on board with essentially ordering a second appraisal, which never happens. Mm -hmm. You know, once the appraisal's in, that's it. You know, you have to stick to that number typically. But I, I told him, I said, hey, I think this is ridiculous. Here are all these comps that we found. You know, this is like $600,000 under value at the minimum. I said, I think we need another appraisal here. And he agreed. And we ordered another appraisal. And because of that, that deal was saved. That deal was on its deathbed. Yeah. We wow. were not going to get that deal done. You, you have to be, as a lender, you have to be one of the smartest in the team and on the room. You can't just be a salesperson. Yeah. I actually pushed back with the SBA when they changed the SOP. This went to like the environmental attorney at SBA yeah. because there was a phase one required or the phase one was dirty on a second piece of property, commercial real estate. That It wasn't primary collateral. And the SOP had just changed. And it says you right. only need that on the primary on collateral, the, not correct. additional collateral. Yeah. And they were going to say, hey, we needed all this. We had to send that loan GP. And I said, I sent them an email, snippet from the SOP, and they're like, oh, you're right. Thanks. We're getting used to these rules. But this was the top, one of the top environmental attorneys at the SBA. But I say all that to say, you've got to be the expert in knowledge and you have to lead, like you have to look at everything in your deal. It's not just about the approval. Come with the receipts, man. Yeah. Every time. You gotta yeah. come with it's, the receipts. It's interesting because a lot of a lot of topics that we cover are 
you know, intentionally geared towards an audience of up and coming folks or just, you know, fans of the SBA lending space period. And a lot of people say they get a lot of good info from it. You know, we talk a lot about referral partners and how to handle, you know, sales stuff and, and term sheets. Bro, that's just the beginning. Right, you know, what I mean? that's that's nothing. Like, because the fact is, yeah, you're just scratching the surface of that. Pump your term sheets all you want. Pipe don't pay. Execution is about closing. Right, it's about getting the deal approved and closed. And you got to be able to get in the weeds on some goofy stuff. What I love about this career is I'm learning stuff all the time. Like yeah. I'm constantly learning stuff from my colleagues, right, from the people around me, from my superiors, and it's it's cool, right? That's the best part of it. But the nuances. Like pushing back on a third party report. Bro, I didn't know that was part of the gig in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't sign up for that, but you, but it's some stuff I've done. Yeah. yeah that, that and phase ones. I push back on phase ones a lot. Right. But I can't just say, no, this is wrong. And no, I have to go and I have to talk to other environmental experts and say, do you agree with this analysis? And if not, what kind of ammo can I take back to push up against it? Because it's really, really light and very, very broad. Yeah. So I'll push back on a phase one all day. I'll, all the time. Appraisals are hard to push back, but I've pushed back on appraisals too. They're just difficult. And it's important to read the third party reports, not just when they're you know not in your favor, just right. skim them if they come back at the value or the, they're clean, just to get used to them if you're a newer yeah. video. So I had an example, I was in Hot Springs, Arkansas, I think a couple of weeks ago, and we had this appraisal. Sounds like a happening town. It actually is. I don't, oh, right. I don't want to spend too much Shout time. Shout out to Hot was, Springs, It was Arkansas. the Vegas before Vegas. All, all right. Everyone go there to gamble first, and they have all these hot springs and, and bathhouses and whatnot. So it was a rowdy So you town. went to the bathhouses? Not this time, next oh, time. Right. But it's a $19 million USDA loan, right? We get in there. Before oh, wow. we leave to go on the trip, the appraisal was short by like $2 million bucks. And Me and the lender were looking like, we don't, this doesn't make sense, and something's off here. And so we found a few things. But the main thing we found when we got there they missed a whole parcel. Oh, wow. Oh, they missed the entire parking wow. structure, which I forget the square footage. They missed it blatantly. And they, so we get there and we're like, wait, it's this. Now, there was a little, little sliver of uh, leased land in between that other parcel. So I could maybe see how that, but if you're, it was a national appraisal firm too. So just that one miss had this lender not been knowledgeable enough to kind of question that, right? And say, right. hey, how could this be short by 2 million? They also missed some things with the earnings and cap rates and things like that. But you miss an entire parcel. We get there, like, this is a big parcel. Right? That, 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 that's a miss. big like, miss. Yeah. That's miss. banana. The appraisal yeah. came back. That the is value very banana. That's, and that's a bunch of bananas. That's an $18 million dollar loan. <laughs> yeah. This is real. The difference 18 million? Like, yeah. So what Sterling's doing and what, you know, knowing how to push back. and Imagine that comp. Oh. Well, it's, it's another lender. But still, even on that deal that you pushed back on, that was a large transaction. When you're able to push back on third party reports, that's the difference between maybe a twenty million dollar year and a thirty million or a forty and a sixty, right? You know, it's those little things that if you can be knowledgeable enough to push back on some of those third party reports, you can get those deals across the finish line. It's already hard enough to get the deal through term sheet, win the deal, get it through committee or get it approved by your credit officer. Don't do yourself a disservice by losing out because of an appraisal or third party report that you didn't really review. Yeah. So I've, I've got a story where getting creative and pushing back, you know, not only won the deal, but got you the, the retap, the, the, the double tap on the deal for to say. So I, I financed this marina. In we really took this pushback into a positive direction. Like we haven't talked a lot of negative. It's kind of great. Uh, but... Absolutely. Because when pushback is done correctly. Right. It, the, the result will always be amicable. Whether you win or lose, you everybody actually right. wins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I had this marina deal, uh, upstate Michigan, a great deal, cash flowed very well, had buyers that were very knowledgeable in the area, but it was this hodgepodge of a bunch of different parcels together. They had the uh, the showroom, they had the repair site, they had all the docks along the, the waterfront, and then they had this parcel that had the gas uh, tank, uh, above ground gas tank, where they would pump the gas for the new deliveries and for uh, uh, repairs of boats coming in uh, for repair. And everything came back fine. The appraisal came back within value. The environmental took forever because of a, a large piece of land. But the tank was not only uh, required a phase two, but upon discovery of the phase two, it was definitely contaminated. It was definitely a facility. So it needed closure. Right, it needed to be cleaned up, and they needed a closure report in order to be able to move forward. So I'm not about to let that kill a four million, a five million dollar deal, mm -hmm. right? And this is a nice parcel of land too, because it's waterfront, it holds all the docks, so it's worth a lot of money. It's worth about a million dollars. So 
instead of pushing back to the environmental company, because I knew that was a losing battle, because the place is definitely a facility with a gas tank that's been leaking, definitely an issue. So I went back to the uh, my credit manager. I said, what if we just carved that entire parcel out? Because they've already delineated and figured out where the contamination is, and it's nowhere near the edges of the parcel. So let's just finance everything else, see if the seller will put a lease in place for that until they get the closure report, get it cleaned up, get a new tank. And then when they come back with the closure report, we'll finance that. Mm. It was beautiful, man. Got it closed. That's brilliant. And yeah. right now it took two years to mm -hmm. get rid of all the contamination, to get a brand new tank, get it all repaired and get it back up and running. But I, I've got a million dollar deal on credit right now for, for him to actually acquire two the, the last parcel. Took Do you two know years. how long ago Ryan spent that money? <laughs> Two years? That commission check's been gone, it's baby. Been gone. I got four daughters. You know it didn't take two months oh for that commission God. check to be gone. Dude, I guess so the moral of the story is, and I've been waiting to say this, I'll hold the button up for after I say it, is you catch more flies or you catch more... Catch more flies. You catch more flies with honey, honey. but yeah. you catch yeah. more honeys yeah. being fly. Yes, honey. <laughs> Oh, hit it, hit it. Yo, I, I almost heard, messed up. I haven't heard that second part. I'm going to have to cop that. You haven't? Oh, I haven't. Where's the oh SBA risk God when you need him? Man. <laughs> Upstate the New SBA York. risk God. Guys, this was an easy episode. This was so sure. easy for us to talk about. I love that. I love topics like this. Again, everybody, thank you for being with us today. Uh, it's topics like these that keep these guys going. It's topics like these that are going to constantly educate every single BDO, new or old, and not even age wise, just whenever. Did so, you point at me when huh? you said old? Because you you're no, he's old. You're not oh, old. Okay. Wow. <laughs> wow. Shots fired. Oh my goodness. Mr. Excel over there. I, I am a young You Gen can get X. me back at some point. You can get me back. I am Gen X, but I'm a young but, Gen X. All right. <laughs> but we just want to thank you guys for being with us. We have a couple more episodes coming to you from Tampa. So thank you for being with us. Go ahead, like, subscribe, send over topics to the BDO show at gmail.com. I'm getting roasted. I know. Shout out to Gen X. Shout out to Gen X. I know he's on. Gen Xers, baby. Oh,